Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State. These are the schools that come to mind when you think of the Big Ten. But what if I told you there was a Big Ten powerhouse hidden in Chicago? Oh yeah, Northwestern? Nope. Let's travel about 21 miles south to the University of Chicago. Oh, you don't remember the maroon? Well then, if this is your introduction to the team, then you're really going to like this. Many teams have taken on the nickname of their school colors throughout history. Big green, big red, orange. He's not so big. But one that is easily forgotten is the maroon. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear big green, I think Jolly Green Giant. When I hear big red, it's obviously gum. But maroon? I think of prideful warriors, and maybe this is because I think of Florida State when I think of the color maroon, but it seems to be a more noble, more respected color. Or maybe I'm clinically insane. Either way, the students and faculty at the University of Chicago met in 1894 to decide on a new uniform color and nickname at the suggestion of their head football coach. They decided the color was going to be maroon, and the nickname? Well, it was getting late, and Todd and Joe were going to fight their donkeys at 7, so they decided it too would be maroon. And that football coach? Amos Alonzo Stagg. Yeah, the guy who won 314 games in his career. The grand old man of football, as they called him. The first paid college coach. Yeah, that Amos Alonzo Stagg. You see, the school's original uniform color was goldenrod. And Stagg was over how easily they became dirty and tasked the aforementioned committee with coming up with a better color. Now, the Golden Rods were a combined 7, 8, and 4 in Stagg's first two years, but after assuming their new badass color, the Maroons went 11, 7, and 1 in 1894, and that was the second of 17 seasons the university enjoyed without a losing record. After four years as an independent, Stagg and the Maroon became founding members of the Western Conference, which would later become the Big Ten. They finished fourth in the conference their first year, going 3-2 and in conference play and 11-2-1 and overall for the season. The Maroon achieved their first undefeated season in 1899, going 12-0-2 ties in their 14 games. But that wasn't the height of their program. In 1905, they once again went undefeated, this time going 11-0 and being voted as national champions, along with 10-0 Yale. They outscored their opponents 271-5, with all five points coming from their 16-5 victory over Indiana. The next year, it was the first year for the legal forward pass, and even though the Maroon only played five games, they outscored their opponents 175-17, and averaged a score of 29-3 while going 4-1. The boys from Chicago won their second national title in a decade in 1913 with an undefeated 7-0 record. They played an all-conference schedule with wins over Indiana, Iowa, Purdue, Illinois, Northwestern, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. The Maroon were consistently one of the top programs in college football and there didn't appear to be any end in sight. Over the next 20 years, however, Chicago alternated seasons where they were either barely above 500 or had losing seasons, and then every once in a while, they would have a really good season. From 1930 to 1932, they went and combined 7-15-4, and this led Amos Alonzo Stagg to be forced to move on from the school. Replacing Stagg was another legendary coach, Clark Shaughnessy. Even though Shaughnessy had won 96 games at his previous two jobs at Tulane and Loyola, he only mustered a disappointing 17-34-4 record in seven seasons in Chicago. An interesting tie between Shaughnessy and football in the city of Chicago, the University C logo would go on to be the logo for the Chicago Bears, where Clark Shaughnessy was an assistant coach in the 50s, even though the logo wouldn't be adopted until 1962. The highlight of his tenure had to be 1935, when his squad went 4-4. Four four. But wait, how is that the highlight of his time there? Not only did it match his highest number of wins in a season with the Maroon, but their halfback, Jay Burwanger, was awarded the prestigious Downtown Athletic Club Trophy in its inaugural season. Pretty awesome, right? You don't think so? Well, what if I told you that the next year, it was renamed the Heisman Memorial Trophy? Burwanger rushed for 577 yards,
passed for 405. Returned kickoffs for 359 yards and scored a combined six touchdowns and added five point after tries. On top of all that, he was the very first player drafted in NFL history, although he never played a down of professional ball. All of this history being made by a team that is hardly known in today's world. Oh, and Shaughnessy? He ended up at Stanford and won a national title with the then Indians his very first year. Interesting to see he was able to win both before and after arriving in Chicago, but could never put it together while there. But there is one more twist to his time in the Windy City. His 2-6 record in 1939 could be attributed to a lack of available players. You see, the University of Chicago had decided to start playing school, and the university's academic demands had taken away a great number of quality players, and this probably led to the poor record. This was actually the last year for University of Chicago football, as school president Robert Hutchins decided that a big-time college football program could not coexist with their commitment to academic excellence and disbanded the program. This ended the lineage of a program that had bred many future Hall of Fame coaches and players and had long been held as a standard bearer for the sport. Now the Maroon did return to the football field in 1963 as a club team and were eventually upgraded to varsity status in 1969 and started playing Division III in 1973. But could you imagine a team winning a national championship and only 27 years later being disbanded? That would be like Florida State winning the 1993 national title and after the 2020 season, the school deciding, ah, nah, we're done with this silly game. Although, that might not be a bad option for FSU right now. And then, could you also imagine traveling to Tallahassee to play a club game of football against the freaking Seminoles? Of course, college football was nowhere near the big business that it presently is, where even a struggling program can stay afloat thanks to generations of fans that are always willing to pay to see their team live and to experience game day at the stadium with their closest friends. While the Maroon found some success in the late 90s and early 2000s, and more recently in 2014 when they won their fifth University Athletic Association Championship, it's definitely a far cry from their Big Ten and national title winning ancestors. I think it would be a shame for a program with such historical significance and impact on the game we all love to just fade away into obscurity. I think it would be a very cool story to see that Chicago has risen to being one of the top programs in D3, and while I know it might not sound important to most people, it would be nice to be able to say that the Maroon have restarted their winning tradition, and no matter what, they will always have the history of their program, and that is something to be proud of.